Hi everyone, I'm John. Welcome back to my channel. Lately, I have not been posting a lot of reviews, and that's because, well, let's just blame it on the holidays. But a lot of other things, uh, work had been wrapping up, and of course, Thanksgiving and, and, and all the other holiday stuff inevitably gets in the way of making videos and, and, and doing things that make me look productive on my YouTube channel. But I actually got one review written of a book that I read with someone else in December. And um, I read this with Vin from uh, Revenant Reads. Um, and I will, I'll thank him more formally at the end of the video. But I, I wanted to get the review out of the way first and talk about this. I think Vin loved this book. And I also really enjoyed this book. Our conversation was um, a, a little bit slowed down by the fact that, you know, like I said, holiday stuff. But uh, the conversation that we had was really enriching, uh, wonderful to have someone to bounce ideas off of. And I wanted to write about it while it was relatively fresh in my memory. So this is it. It's called Bloodlands, Europe Between Hitler and Stalin by Timothy Schneider, um, the international bestseller. And uh, Bloodlands, by the way, the Bloodlands of the title, is the land roughly between Berlin and Moscow, bordered by the Baltic Sea to the north uh, and the Black Sea to the south, including large parts of eastern Poland, Ukraine, Belarus, and the Baltic states, where most of the horrific mass atrocities occurred uh, in surrounding and, and, and shortly after World War II. This expanse is what he calls the Bloodlands. Uh, so according to one estimate, the monomaniacal regimes of Adolf Hitler and Stalin were responsible for the deaths of 14 million people, the vast majority of whom were civilians between the years of 1933 and 1945 uh, in these geographic regions. Timothy Snyder is the Richard C. Levin Professor of History at Yale University. And this is his best-selling attempt to account and reckon with, in all senses of those two words, the lives that were lost. Snyder divides up these years, like I said, roughly 1933 to 1945, into three parts which are characterized by who did most of the killing when. So you have the years 1933 to 1938, in which the Stalinist show trials that were happening in Soviet Russia and the Great Terror accounted for most of the deaths. And then in 1939, uh, Soviets and Germans killed people in roughly equal numbers. Uh, 1939 to 1941, I'm not sure if I gave the ending date there. And then in 1941 to 1945, when the uh, German implementation of the so-called final solution took place, that is when Germans finally overtook the Russians in their, uh, their mass killing spree. Uh, roughly each chapter is kind of uh, divided up to discuss one of the ways in which people and populations were targeted relative to one of the two regime's ideologies. Uh, Snyder opens with the starving of the Ukrainian kulaks, the um, sort of agrarian farmer class that wasn't in dire poverty, but owned a small amount of land, just maybe uh, enough to support their family on, but that was enough for Stalin to target them as wealthy capitalist infiltrators. Um, he opens up with the, the purposeful starvation of the Ukrainian kulaks during the Holodomor, 
which started actually in 1932 and went through 1933. But um, this sort of began uh, Stalin's mad rush towards a mass Soviet industrialization and agricultural collectivization. There are other chapters which uh, they sometimes overlap, but they focus on Stalin's persecution of ethnic minorities, Stalin's persecution of Jews and his anti-Semitism, the construction of the gulags and the stalags, etc. And while the Holocaust doesn't play a central role in the book, uh, the development of the plans for it are kind of unavoidable when discussing mass, mass death in the bloodlands. Uh, the General Plan Ost, uh, the, the, the master plan for the East in German, uh, that, was the name, that was the name for the Nazi plan developed alongside the Nazi plans for sort of ethnic cleansing to create a broad living space for Germans in Eastern Europe and, and uh, like I said, the, the, the regions that we were talking about, maybe even Western Russia too, of small farming communities and village complexes that would be operated by Germans in a sort of a, like a sort of idyllic utopian German Aryan farming community or set of communities. Um, Hitler had this idea called uh, Lebensraum or living living space or living room for Germans uh, to sort of. Uh, he thought that he would just people uh, all of Europe with Germany once he had gotten rid of everyone else. Uh, and to accomplish their goals, the Nazis actually had documents where they outlined, where they outlined their plans to kill uh, portions of entire countries and ethnicities of people um, and it's really, really just blood curdling to see on on a piece of paper, um, as if what he and Stalin did weren't horrible enough. They had plans to casually kill in this uh, sort of seeking out this this uh, plan to uh, create this series of farming communities and create this living space for Germans to kill or remove uh, 60, uh, excuse me, 70 to 80 million Russians. And that's just Russians, uh, but also 50% each of Estonians, Latvians, and Czechs, and between 75 and 85% each of Belarusians, Poles, and Lithuanians. Um, these were plans that they made significant progress toward, but of course, ultimately did not achieve before, uh, the war was ended. But, uh, even if many of these people, uh, had been able to survive just the sheer logistics of shuffling around 100, 200 million people all over Europe must have been just mind-boggling to do. But that was Hitler's plan. Um, and again, I, I'm not trying to say he was, he was uh, planning on moving everyone at the beginning. It was clear that from the outset that he wanted to kill many, many people. But he also wanted to relocate any of them. Um, and as you'll see in a second, when that failed, he just started um, killing them en masse instead. Uh, in synthesizing a mass of older information about both Nazi and Soviet killing, Timothy Schneider comes close to producing a, a pretty definitive account of mass civilian death at this time and place. And throughout the book, he, he also dispels really prevalent mistakes and misconceptions, like the association of mass killings with Nazi, de Nazi concentration camps, particularly Auschwitz. 
uh, or that Stalin killed far more people than Hitler did by sending them off to the gulags. While discussing various kinds of state-sponsored mass murder, he inevitably, inevitably must discuss the evolution of the final solution, which, uh, at least at its beginning, was never intended to be a systematic killing of all of Europe's Jewish population. That was not the way it started, at least. Uh, as late as 1940, the Nazi plan for the Jews was to relocate them uh, to Palestine, uh, oddly enough, and uh, then the, or also, the French colony, what was then the French colony of Madagascar. It was only when this proved increasingly untenable for a number of reasons, including a a naval blockade, and because of Hitler's unexpected difficulties in in invading uh, the Soviet Union during Operation Barbarossa the following year, that the final solution, as we think of it today, began to take shape. His plans to relocate people just fell apart because he had to uh, allocate resources to other places. And uh, he had people telling him that just killing these people would be so much easier than relocating them. The vast majority of those uh, sent to the gulags, about 90% actually, survived. Uh, Stalin initiated the most death, not in Siberian gulags, but in the Ukraine where he starved millions of Ukrainian kulaks, like I mentioned earlier, to a point where it was not uncommon to see parents kill their sickest child so they could have meat to survive a grueling winter. And while over one million prisoners died at the hands of Nazis, ten million more died in other ways, mostly by being shot or gassed in mobile they called killing units, or by being purposefully starved to death. By the time most Jews had died in Auschwitz, gas chambers, uh, by the time most Jews had died in Auschwitz gas chambers from 1943 onward, ten times as many people had died in other ways. Uh, it should go without saying that this doesn't make for uplifting reading especially uh, during the holiday season. Uh, the aforementioned cannibalism of children and other family members uh, just scratches the surface of the horrors that this book discusses. But it nevertheless taught me a lot about history that I probably should have learned about a long time ago, uh, including how the Molotov-Ribbentrop line, the, the line that sort of split up Poland into an eastern and western Poland and gave the Nazi regime control of the eastern half and, the, uh, and, and Stalin control of the... Uh, uh, the Nazis control of the western half and Stalin control of the eastern half. Um, how... Uh, how, uh, how Operation Barbarossa was the code name for the 1941 German invasion of Russia. How did I get by with not knowing that? And how the failures of Operation Barbarossa uh, changed the shape, like I said earlier, of Hitler's plans for Jews and other undesirables. But um, uh, a really, like I've I've described Iris Chang's book before, a harrowing book, uh, but very insightful and uh, one I'm glad I read. Like I said, I wanted to more formally thank Vin at the end of my video. Um, he read this with me the last half of December, which is not the easiest time to engage in uh, reading a book with someone else, and he had a lot of patience with me while he read it. And um, I just wanted to thank, some, thank him, thank him for all the wonderful, kind, and, and thoughtful comments that he left on Voxer that helped me sort of navigate my way through a book and shed a lot of light on the stuff I was reading. 
So thanks, Sven, if you're watching this. I appreciate it. And I will be back soon with another video, uh, maybe some more book reviews, which I should really get on, by the way. Uh, I have a lot of catching up to do. I will see you anon. Bye.